So really, everything's just bigger in Texas, right? <laughs> All right. So first off, let's thank these people, because this is always a labor of love. And these people have, I mean, I never imagined this. You get the, good, you get the prize for being the biggest, and I might say the fab, most fabulous as well, but don't tell the New York branch that. <laughs> we never meant that. We love them all the same. So I really just started this because I wanted to talk to people and talk about how awesome our jobs are. And, you know, it, it's grown, and I could have never imagined that. So thank you for being here, and it's you guys, too, that are amazing. So give a round of applause. <laughs> Toast for you guys. Come on. And then you might hate me for the rest of the night, so we're good now. All right, so I'm going to tell you why Pluto is not a planet. And also about New Horizons. Don't boo Pluto. <laughs> All right. So because you knew Pluto was demoted, you might have known there's a sea of planetesimals and icy bodies orbiting outside of Neptune. If you didn't know that, you do now. So when everyone talks about Pluto being demoted, I say it went home, because there's a, more than a thousand known objects that orbit beyond Neptune. Um, those different colors mean different orbits, but the white circles are actually orbits that are very similar to Pluto. And it's somewhere in this plot, there's a crosshair and a circle. I think it's down the bottom near the gap. That's Pluto. So it really did go home. It really is, the Kuiper belt is the remnants left over from planet formation. And it is really telling us things about how our solar system formed and evolved. Pluto is just one of the biggest. So these are the largest ensemble of dwarf planets that are out there. Now, Eris is the object that killed Pluto. Now with New Horizons, don't be sad. Pluto doesn't have feelings. Doesn't have feelings, I promise. They gave me a PhD, so I know that. <laughs> and I started grad school the week, like the month before Pluto was demoted, and I studied the Kuiper Belt, and they still gave me a degree a few years later. <laughs> and my thesis advisor killed Pluto, so I do have to admit that, you know, I did sign on the dotted line, might have been in blood, that Pluto's not a planet. But, um, but I did discover 2007 OR10. Yes, it needs a name, I know, bug me later about it. But it's one of these dwarf planet-sized objects that are about Pluto-sized. And each of these objects tells us something about planet formation. All these guys have sort of ices on their surface, like methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide. Pluto just happens to be, now that we know from New Horizons, just a little bit bigger than Eris. So maybe you want to call it the king of the Kuiper belt. That might get, make it could feel better. Um, Eris is actually 25% more massive than Pluto. So who wins on mass versus size? I don't know. Bigger, smaller, massive. But the idea is that how do you get two objects that are the same size, roughly, but very different composition? So Eris has more rock in it. How do you get that? We don't quite know. So if we assume they had the same collisional history, we might have expected they would be the same. So already that's telling us something. So Pluto getting demoted to dwarf planet really just put it back into this large group of sort of bodies like it that are in the outer solar system. And this is about it. There are not that many more objects of this size, about, 15, uh, about a 1,500 kilometers in, in radius that are out there. So these, these, you know, the rest of the objects are smaller and don't have volatiles other than water ice. So really, you know, we haven't visited this area. So New Horizons has been exciting because this is our first time getting up and close to one of these. But by knowing about Pluto, we get to understand about the rest of these. So if this, let's see if the movie works. Yes. OK, so this was the best resolution we had of Pluto, basically from Hubble Space Telescope. And you might notice it's patchy and that it's really damn blurry. <laughs> um, that's not the beer. It really is that blurry. <laughs> Get in the There's someone clapping. It gets worse as I go on. OK, so this is actually because Pluto has an, uh, a moon called Charon. And so with Char when Charon goes in front and behind, we can use the light from Pluto to sort of figure out patches of its surface. But really, it's blurry because this is the best we can do from Earth. The patches are telling us something about the surface composition. So we know that there's methane. We know that there's nitrogen. We know there's water ice. And there's also this stuff we don't know what the fuck it is. And so we call it tholins. And Tholins is some shit that's red. That's all we know about it. Really, like it's in the spectra, it's red. It's like we grump it together and we're like, Tholins, cool. Okay, so the dark patches are probably Tholins. And maybe the other ices are nitrogen ice. That's kind of what we know. And that we know Pluto has an atmosphere. So when it, it has passed in front of a star, and so you can watch 
it blink out that star and then also outside of it also blink out from the star and that's because it has an atmosphere. So we know that these ices are sort of sublimating on the summer pole that's in light and sort of recondensing out onto the winter pole. So we knew that you know, there was this cycle going on. So yes, it's a living world, still not a planet. Okay, just because it's got stuff and active going on doesn't make it a planet. Titan, which is the largest moon of Saturn, has an atmosphere and a uh, hydrological cycle with not water, but, but methane and ethane. So there are other things in our solar system that are act have active processes and are cool. So planet is just this thing we use for the big things that are massive. If that's the only thing you got out of my talk tonight, awesome. Later you can bring the pitchforks out and tell me Pluto's a planet. <laughs> okay. So New Horizons uh, was launched about 10 years ago when Pluto was a planet, and then shortly after it was demoted. But hey, once you get the spacecraft off, NASA's not gonna pull it back. It's not gonna be like, come back. So the cool thing about New Horizons is that to get to Pluto, it took 10 years. It is the fastest moving spacecraft. It has Kevlar around the uh, computer because it's going so fast that a dust grain could like basically blow a hole. As we saw earlier, like in this same thing with like the, you know, the ISS, same thing here. So they have a Kevlar basically jacket trying to protect uh, the computer. And so the cool thing about this is because it took 10 years, um, New Horizons has one of the youngest engineering teams because they need these people to be actually active at NASA, not retired when the thing got to Pluto. So it was the youngest, like it was the youngest engineering team because, and the, cool, the weird thing is this faulted like three, a few days before closest approach. So they, you needed that team. Um, so the cool thing about this mission, and maybe the sad thing, is that it's, Pluto is not massive enough for the spacecraft to orbit. So do they fly by? One shot, you get it wrong, <laughs> or the instruments aren't working, you lose all that data. So it was a really risky mission, or if a dust particle actually did hit the wrong area, you could end it. But there was getting this amazing data from this mission. And so here is you know, Pluto and Charon. So what you probably started to see was this orbiting. So this is way out, of, um, when is this? This is June, so this is about a month before this close flyby. And you can see the bright pixels in the center, that's Pluto. And then orbiting around it, that sort of smaller dot, that's Charon, its largest moon. And it went from that to that. So they really are like, and the best thing is that like we didn't expect anything. So like this was like, uh, who ordered that? <laughs> um, which is always fun because like, you know, we never, we had some ideas what we were seeing. Um, I can say one thing is that the colors were sort of expected. So Pluto is, you know, and people talked about this in the press and was like, we knew this. It's broad pictures, you know, broad strokes we've gotten from ground observation you know, that have been studying Pluto and these large objects. So we expect Pluto to be brownish. Um, because of this tholins and the other volatiles are being irradiated for 4.6 billion years. They get this dark gunk. So we expect that it's going to be darker. Now, Sharon has no signature of these volatiles from ground-based spectroscopy. We only see water ice. So we expected it to be brighter, shinier, more pristine. It's basically what you see. Not quite so good with this projector, but Sharon turns up pretty white. Then when you got closer, Pluto looked like that. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> like that's the, like, so the, the heart, as it's been called, is in the mid-latitude regions. So the really weird thing is that when you look at it in stretched color, so it's the same thing, but you're stretching the color, the heart breaks, which is sad. Yeah. So that means like something is going on with the surface, yet they're same reflective. And the best is that carbon monoxide, like we know it's been on Pluto, is centered in the, like, the darker area of the heart. Why? I don't know. Nobody knows. So the thing is that the other thing, if you look at it is, we expected Pluto to be pretty damn cratered. Because it's small, it shouldn't be active. It should have used up its 1126. There shouldn't be much left. So it shouldn't be very warm. It might have had, still have an ocean. Might not, might have froze out. But that there shouldn't be much going on the surface other than sort of the deposition of, and sublimation of these ices and then redeposition onto the surface. But you don't really see any craters, and you would expect even if there's nitrogen snow coming on, you'd still see some edges of craters. Now, this is a zoomed in picture. This is one of the closest we get from New Horizons. You still don't see craters, but there are water ice mountains. Yeah, there's water ice mountains on Pluto, which is pretty incredible that there is enough force to raise, to raise mountains. Why? We still need to figure that out, but it's an amazing discovery. The other thing is there's these planes of Pluto. 
And you can see these sort of cells, which means there was some kind of convection in the interior. Again, sort of somewhat surprising that it was there. And we see these on some of the icy satellites, um, which are next to giant planets where there is a source to give energy to the interior to do this kind of process. So these are the low resolution data. It takes a year to get the data from New Horizons back to the Earth. So this is like the, this is the preview. The high resolution data, because Pluto is so far away, they compress the images. They're JPEG artifacts, so that's what some of the black stuff is in the image. And then they're slowly over the next year sending out the data from the spacecraft. So next December, they will, the science team will have everything. Okay, so this is Ceres. This is the largest dwarf planet and the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. So. It also used to be a planet, but 100 years ago, and nobody's alive who remembered that, so they're, that, that no one yells about it. So if you want Pluto to be a planet, you better start calling Ceres 1-2. Don't leave it out. Just that because rock is harder, it's harder to meld it into a planet. So, you know. But so next time, just be like Ceres and Pluto, and it's all fine. Okay, so if you notice, Ceres is very cratered. It's had a lot of stuff hit it. That's exactly what we sort of expected Pluto and Charon to look like. There's Sharon. Can, can anybody count the craters? <laughs> Do you see any? This was the what the fuck moment. This was like, who ordered this shit? Okay. And the best was I like, I've said like, New Horizons is going to be boring. You know, we expected this. So the cool, the, Pluto, you know, Sharon doesn't have an atmosphere. It doesn't have volatiles. We expected this thing was going to give us a size distribution for the Kuiper Belt. It was going to be awesome. Where the fuck are the craters? <laughs> Fury, where are the craters? <laughs> and so we don't know. So it looks like some surface process happened and actually recoded the surface. And we've seen this in the icy satellites, like Enceladus, which actually has geysers on the South Pole. That's pretty awesome. Okay, but Enceladus is next to Saturn. And Saturn's really massive and is ripping the in in interior of Enceladus. So there's a heat source. Pluto and Charon don't have that. <laughs> so what the hell's going on? We don't know. They're literally like the press conferences are people speculating. It might mean that everything we know about icy satellites has been wrong because we've always assumed that the interior energy to sort of resurface came because of the big bad guy sitting next to it that was ripping its interior gravitationally through tides. And so we don't know, but it might mean that P Pluto and Charon are gonna rewrite the history books of what we understand about icy satellites and that it might be that the, the tides that you need and the the, the strength to sort of rip the interior to get this heat to recoat the surface happens on much smaller scales. So I think that's really exciting that sort of the guy sitting on the outer solar system might be telling us something about sort of the mid solar system. Now, the most pretty image is this one. So New Horizons did its thing, looked at Pluto, kept going, and then this is the backside. So this is actually scale to human eye. So this is what you would see if you were on New Horizons and could not breathe oxygen and be fine, but <laughs> why did that get a laugh? Okay, so that's the atmosphere. You're seeing the haze and it's got a blue, you know, blue atmosphere, kind of like the earth, which is, it's, it's a stunning image. So we can just take a moment and enjoy it. All right, we're good. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty cool that a spacecraft that we sent is, was able to take this. So. What actually is the atmosphere is maybe more the interesting thing, or I think is interesting, is that it's actually as hazes. So because you have this methane and nitrogen, they get broken up by the, by the solar intensity, and they form higher order hydrocarbons, organics, the same way you see in Titan. So if you've ever seen images of Titan, it's very, very hazy, same kind of thing. You can actually see them. So what they did is they took this New Horizons image, and then in that color bit, they like, really tried hard with the scaling, and you can see the haze and how it changes as you get to Pluto's surface. So I think that's pretty cool, that now you can start figuring out sort of how Pluto's climate's working. So all this information from this very plucky spacecraft going by and getting about a day's worth of like imaging. And now New Horizons can't see Pluto. It's way beyond, and Pluto's now too dim for it to really do any science. Now, I didn't say that Pluto has also a whole bunch of collisionally formed moons. They look like this. So this is Nix and Hydra. They're two of the other few smaller ones. We think they're collisionally formed. And this is a bit scaled. They are like weird blocks because we think they're just like impact fragments. But Nix is red, has a red patch. What the hell is that? 
So it might be some of that stolen material that got knocked off with the impact. So I think that's pretty cool that we're able to sort of chemically figure that out. And there's actually spectroscopy for these as well, but that data's got to wait to come. But, you know, pretty pictures first, spectro spectroscopy and lines later. So yeah, there's a lot more data to come. Okay, so where is New Horizons going? Okay, well, it's just gonna leave the solar system. So it's gonna be like the Voyager spacecraft. It just keeps going. Would be cool if it could orbit. Uh, you might ask, could it go to one of the other dwarf planets? No. They're all, sadly, they're all on the other side of the damn solar system. So there's no fuel to like turn around and go to them. So it has to keep going. So there's been a huge ground campaign to try to find a target to go to next. Um, next, well now I think it's a, it might be official, but until they extend the mission, it's potential. But okay, it's already going there. NASA's gonna fund this damn thing, right? Like, it's like, go there, but don't take any photos. So, <laughs> so with the Hubble Space Telescope, they actually found um, a object in the main belt of the Kuiper belt. So this, all these red objects, so it's very typical to what exists out beyond Neptune. And the cool thing, and I think this might be almost cooler than the mission, the original mission is, the cold classical Kuiper belt formed likely in place. So everything that the last 10 years that people have been studying the Kuiper belt have learned is that the cold classical is this weird, weird construct compared to the rest of these objects that we think were scattered out when the giant planets bounced around in the, in the earlier parts of our solar system's history. So if we can, so Pluto tells us sort of about the period of objects before that scattering, but cold classicals would tell us something about actually how they formed there and the conditions there. So we can't see them, they're very small, we can't get much data from them from the ground, and we're gonna get a close-up picture of it from New Horizons. So that's where it's headed, it has a quote target, and they're putting in their extended mission, but it's already going there. Um, so hopefully there'll be some images from it. So I, I really think is that we've now, you know, they said that like a world has come into view, and I really think it has. So now, you know, we have pictures of everything. Pluto's still not a planet, <laughs> but, we have another world and the Kuiper Belt, which probably most of you didn't know before we started finding these other dwarf planets. We now have a better idea about. So with that, thank you. And let's give a round of applause to everybody that helps put this together. Um, I am going to use this opportunity to recover my drink. <laughs> All right, any questions for OG AOT? Right down here, Dawn. So you said it's the fastest traveling probe, right? Yeah. How much faster is it traveling than Voyager? I don't know. So, um, pretty much like Voyager's out further, right? So it's not going to beat Voyager. So Voyager's out at 100 AU. Um, this is out at, you know, 30, so it's still got a way to go. So it made, it, so I, you know, you could do the math and see if it will actually overtake. I'm not sure if it will, because Voyager's had a pretty good, like, head start. The interesting thing is you might have heard Voyager's out of the solar system. It's not. Okay, so, <laughs> to give you some scale, the inner Oort cloud, where there's some ob weird objects that shouldn't be there, is about 500 to about 2,000 AU. So AU is distance between the Earth and the Sun. The Oort cloud, the source of our comets, is out at 20,000 AU. So yeah, th there's other effects called the heliopause, so this, the end of the sun sort of uh, influence of the solar wind is about 100 AU, so Voyager 1 exited that, but it's well within our solar system. So if you hear it's not in the solar system, tell them they're wrong. <laughs> um, third row over here. Can you repeat that? So you're asking whether they have sim Pluto and Earth have similar atmosphere. Well, we have nitrogen in our atmosphere, but we're also very warmer and thicker. So Pluto's just barely holding on to this atmosphere. They call it an exosphere because it's actually losing it. Um, so it's very different processes because out here you have the nitrogen ice sublimating where we don't ever get that nitrogen sort of condensing out into to the surface. So they're very, very different processes. Um, and yeah, so for us, we don't, so for the Earth, it's very, very different. Um, 
But you could think of the fact that you have these sort of, the caps sort of snowing out as something that might be similar in some respects, but they're pretty very different. The cool thing is New Horizons has actually detected sort of that smearing of the atmosphere. Now the other thing that I didn't mention is that this like spot, dark spot on, on uh, uh, Sharon, uh, it's been nicknamed Mortar by the team. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, right? Okay, they actually think that's bits of Pluto's atmosphere falling out onto the cool winter pole of Sharon, and then because it's nitrogen and methane, again, tholins happen, um, and so that is tholins, but you can actually see there's an impact crater, and it sort of digs in, and so they think it's a very, almost like a fingernail sort of like layer of material. So very different types of atmospheres and processes compared to the Earth. Here's one right at the back. They, There's a second question. Uh, a second question is, uh, you showed a map of uh, all of the uh, dwarf planets. One of them is football shaped, and but it's comparable in size to all the rest. So I'm going to grab it and put it Nice. OK. You win the prize for figuring out how May is weird. OK. <laughs> yeah. OK. So for terms of, uh, now I remember, forget the first one. OK, the first one was like, is there some kind of disc like Voyager? I think there's something. There was some NASA campaign. I didn't pay attention. Uh, there is ashes of Clyde Tombaugh, which is, might be weird. So Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto, and some of his ashes went by Pluto. So there was that. I don't think that's the gift you want to give aliens. but. <laughs> Yeah, here, here you go. I think there's names from people. There's some, a couple other things that the New Horizons did. It's all on the New Horizons website, which is pretty awesome. So you can go there and find it. Um, OK, but let me tell you about Haumea, because it is fucking weird. OK, I could give a whole talk on Haumea, but OK. So it is football shaped, and it doesn't, OK. The reason it's football shaped is because it's actually mainly rock, which is weird, because Pluto's half rock, half ice. Eris is a little bit more rock than ice. So why is Haumea only rock? Um, but the best thing is when you actually take a spectrum and you look at what the surface has on it, it's pure water ice. It's one of the deepest water ice spectrum we have in the solar system. It's pretty pristine, like be awesome to drink if you could mine it, drink it, be great. Okay, so what we think is it's like an M&M, so that like, it has basically the rock and a very little amount of water. And so all these Kuiper objects are differentiated, just like the Earth is, where they were, when they formed, they were able to mold with gravity and separate out the rock from the ice. So we think is that basically another, like, Pluto-sized object smashed into it and shattered the water ice mantle. And so that's why you have these two moons, which have pure water ice spectrum. They're actually the deepest in the solar system. And there's a whole collection of other objects that you can sort of tie back to the same region that are very blue in a very water ice spectrum. So it's the first collisional family ever identified in the Kuiper belt. There are others we know in the asteroid belt, but there's complications why it's harder to do in the Kuiper belt. So we think that Haumea got smashed into, and the other evidence for that is it's rapidly rotating almost at the point of breakup. So we think is that it got smacked, w spun up, all of the mantle broke off and formed these other Kuiper objects in the two moons, which are Hiyaka and Namaka. Yeah, Hawaiian names, they're, but they're fun. So it was named after a monster that flings her children out. Pretty good description <laughs> for the objects. Okay. I didn't name it. We've got time for one more question. Um, are the, in the middle here. Yep, go ahead. Okay, what are the similar elements to Earth's atmosphere that are in Pluto's? Nitrogen, we have a little bit of methane, we have some CO, so carbon monoxide, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's some water from water ice, so those are pretty much the same things. It's just the abundances and, and the scale of the atmospheres. The hazes are a little different. We have hazes, we have ozone, which, which Pluto probably doesn't have. Um, but we're learning more. So basically, we're waiting for this data to come down. So the broad brushstrokes are that. But I think we're going to learn a lot more um, as the data from New Horizons comes down. And the science team gets to actually crack at it. They're sort of chopping at the bit to get the high resolution data. OK, let's say thank you again to OGAOT. Thank you.